Excellent. Uh, so welcome to Using What You've Got, Why We Gave Up and Embrace Microsoft Tools. Congratulations for making it to the end of SGA. This is the last presentation. We are very happy to see your faces. We were worried we weren't going to see anybody. Uh, so welcome. Yay. Uh, OK, so let's start with some introductions. <laughs> I clicked it. Well, oh, it's I am it Nicole Lawrence. I am the Assistant Director of the Digital Library of Georgia. Um, I don't, I do a lot of things for DLG, um, probably most applicable to this. Uh, I am kind of the de facto project manager, so even people that I don't um, kind of oversee, I'm responsible for wrangling all of the things and overview uh, and reporting that to our director, Sheila McAllister. Um, but I also manage the metadata unit and the Georgia Historic Newspapers unit. Um, I do a lot of outreach with Sheila. I do lots of things for DLG. <laughs> and this is uh, my co-presenter, Rachel. Hello. Um, you guys can hear me too. So I'm Rachel Sees. I'm the digital project coordinator at Georgia State University. So I oversee all of our digitization, our grant digitization, our kind of grant digitization partners with DLG, as well as all of our oral history processing. So there's a lot of stuff kind of going on that we have to keep track of. I don't have as much as you, but <laughs> it still seems like a lot. So. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about today? Um, we're going to be presenting case studies on DLG and GSU's migration from our various project tracking and management tools to Microsoft products. Um, we're going to start by talking about uh, what we, we were using and why we needed to find alternatives. Um, each one of us will talk to you about our department or unit structure, um, kind of the needs assessment that we ran through, the design of what we uh, our solution, current solutions. I will emphasize current because none of these are in their final form. Um, and then we'll also cover stumbling blocks and take a bit of time to do some review and reflection. Um, I know we put this in the description, but I do want to state this again. This is not a tutorial, even though it's focused on Microsoft products. There's a very robust community out there of people who teach how to use Microsoft products. Uh, if you do have any questions about how we specifically did something or want to see like a deeper in-depth how our structure is, I think either one of us are happy to get with you and kind of walk you through that on like a Zoom screen share or something. Um, but that's not what this session is about. Um, it's really more focused on project management. Uh, and then the tools we are using to do that sort of project management. So, oh, I skipped it. Okay, so I said this once already. What do we mean by project management? Because that's a big term that can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. Um, so let's be clear. Uh, neither Rachel or I are a certified project manager. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, we're not certified project managers. I don't think either of these projects was really at the scale where we had to employ like very formal project management structures. It doesn't follow agile or waterfall or any of those other fancy terms. Um, there were things like project charters. Um, we didn't do risk evaluation. The risk was not doing this. Um, so what do we mean by project management? Uh, we're going to broadly talk about the principles, kind of like the whole phase of project management from ideation to planning, development, implementation, review and reflection. That's a big one. Um, needs assessment. Needs is capital here because needs is very important. Um, there were a lot of wants that were surfaced and wants kind of got added to the, we'll do that when things aren't broken list. Um, and then we'll also talk about the reflection and revision part of the process. Yeah, so what were we using before? Am I first? You are first. What were we using before? Uh, okay, so at DLG, we, we used all kinds of things. Uh, we had Google Sheets, we had Airtables, we had um, our metadata administration system. We had straight up text documents. We even had this giant physical Gantt chart on the wall of our conference room, which I gotta say was really useful when, like in the before times when we were in our conference room uh, two days a week going through the review process. A, a bit time intensive, but it was a really handy tool. As you can imagine, that did not transition to work from home 
very well. Um, this is actually the couple of years aftermath all the stickies have fallen off. Because <laughs> even at this point, we're never in the conference room together, right? The whole team is, is kind of random work from home days. We don't all pile in a conference room and like sardines anymore. So it really just didn't work for us. I did not have a Gantt chart. I did not have a Gantt chart. <laughs> So when I started, I actually started the pandemic, so I was trying to piece together what was being done before. So we had, um, there are a lot of separate pieces. All of our project management was done in spreadsheets. And so there was, I call it spreadsheet hell, where we had <laughs> project version one, project version one edits, project version one final, project version one final final. I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on here. Um, we also had a submission process for our projects that was a very simple form on our internet and it got sent to an email. And a lot of times it actually gets kind of blocked by spam. So that was kind of one of our issues that I faced. And then we also had our hand community whiteboard where we had, this is a later version of what we had, but we would have like progress statuses on our whiteboard where we would have project X. Box number one, two, and three, we have like special stickies. I'm like, who's working on it? What's the progress? Like, you know, it's like, it's almost done. Yay. And then somebody would follow up with, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was our game chart. <laughs> so we, it was a lot of like very disjointed pieces that really needed a lot of manual labor to keep them on track. So not the greatest solution, especially in the age of COVID. So, no, I don't need to do that. I am, there we go. So, why did we switch? So a lot of it had to do, at least for me, with COVID-19. I was remote. There was the possibility of my staff having to be remote part of the days. I might not be on campus when they're on campus. And there's a lot of confusion and a lot of versioning and those issues. Again, but you held versioning issues. Um, workflow interruptions. If I got sick and there were submission projects coming in and I couldn't access my email, no one could get to those projects. So those were a lot of issues that we were kind of facing again, personal dependencies. It all really depended on me. And if I was not there, the whole workflow stopped. Um, Black hole syndrome, a lot of our archivists, when we were doing projects, were very adamant that we don't understand what's happening when you're working on projects, and we really want to know what's going on. We send boxes down there, and it's a black hole, and we never hear anything again. And also, um, system discrepancies. I don't know, but I'll chime in and say that... Um, yeah, along with all of that, because DLG has so many people and they were all using their own preferred solution. Like you never knew whether you needed to check Airtable or Google. And if you were in Google, if you needed to use the DLG account or your personal work account, or a, 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 a general chaos is a very good <laughs> yeah. I should also say that with our version of the issues on all of our spreadsheets, they lumped metadata and um, project tracking into one spreadsheet, which created issues down the line when we were uploading collections or something had to be done. And they're like, no, no, you can't use the spreadsheet. And we're like, well, we need to upload. They're like, it's not done. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So we really needed to separate out a lot of that. Um, but the biggest thing was money. Money was um, a challenge, and state contracts were a challenge. So I had no budget for this. There was no budget for this, and um, we knew we had, had to make a change. And we looked at alternatives, we looked at upgrading some of the stuff that we had, to build some of the functions that we wanted. We looked at like Trello and Asana and all that, and it wasn't really getting as granular as I wanted it to get to. And with the amount of people that wanted access and needed access, we were going to be in like the hundreds every month. And so that was not in our budget. Yeah, there are definitely solutions out there that do this that aren't Microsoft, but I couldn't find one that wasn't a per user per year cost. And if you are a USG institution and you want to get that approved, good luck. If, you get, if you've done that, let me know. 
So now we're going to jump into our case studies. But before we do that, we're going to go over some of the Microsoft tools real quick. This QR code leads to my handout that we created. So it has more information about the tools, some of the comparable tools that are out there that you might be a little bit more familiar with, what each of these um, tools do, and just kind of some tips and, tips and tricks, as well as some project management um, resources for you to use, as well as Office 365 resources for you to use, and just a whole bunch of stuff in there, and questions that you can ask yourself as you're going through this process. So Teams is kind of the base of everything that kind of Office 365. It incorporates all the tools. It incorporates outside tools as well. And so that's kind of like your base. Um, Slack is kind of like Slack with Skype and all sorts of stuff built like in. I mean, Microsoft Forms, kind of self-explanatory. It's Forms, like Google Forms. Excel is self-explanatory. Um, Planner is very much kind of like the Trello system when you have the cards and it, you can have buckets or you can move it across and have lists and attach things to it and all sorts of fun stuff. Lists is kind of like Airtable and it's the new version of, I would say, Access, where you have um, it's more of a database instead of Excel. It has some functionality built into it, but Excel does not. Um, it's very handy. And then Power Automate is programming for non programmers. So it's ish. <laughs> um, if you want to get real fancy with it, you're doing programming, but you can do it as a non programmer. I figured it out, you can figure it out. So I can't program to save my life. Um, it really is what ties each of these tools together. So if you're using a Microsoft form and you want to have results dumped into lists, it'll do that for you. And you set it how you want to set it. So this is just the primary. And then there's also OneNote, which I feel like everybody's kind of familiar with, and then SharePoint. Which is where you store a lot of documents. So, all right, let's start with me. I'm going to switch on hop on this side. Um, okay, so we'll start with DLG. Um, I'm the newer of the implementations. I actually consulted Rachel uh, before I took on this project. Um, I think we're probably more simple than GSU's implementation, um, and I'll talk about why that is. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll start with us. So uh, if, if you don't know the Digital Library of Georgia, uh, then oh, man, come talk to me afterwards and I'll introduce you to us. Um, we wrangle a lot of things, like so many things. And we really needed a, a comprehensive system to tie all of those pieces that you saw earlier together. Um, we've got six-ish functional units, depending on how you organize it. Uh, so admin is where we um, lump things like our outreach, billing, um, grants and grant applications that we're working on that sort of doesn't actually fit into an imaging or metadata workflow or a newspaper's workflow. Um, we've got imaging and curation, metadata and PR units. Those things pass projects back and forth between multiple people multiple times to get different things done for each bit of the project. Uh, we've got two newspaper units that have very similar workflows but work very independently, have their own billing structures and queues. Um, we also, at any given point in time, have multiple project types going. So we have what we call our cost recovery, uh, which is um, services that we provide to partners, uh, uh, usually done through things like private funding or grants, um, or even things like one-time allotments, like the ARPA funds for public libraries, fall into this category. And it's where uh, our partners have covered the cost of our services. Uh, we also do a yearly docket of subgrants, which are grants of services that we, uh, it's a competitive application um, that we do, we perform services on behalf of our partners. So we've got a queue of those going yearly. Um, and then we have UGA work. Uh, one of the benefits to UGA of having us hosted there is that they get to rely on our infrastructure and some of our expertise. So this is the kind of work that we have to fit in regardless of what else is going on because they help fund us. Um, and then on top of all of that, if you aren't aware, uh, DLG is not a collecting institution. So we do all of this work on behalf of our partners. So not only do we need to know what happens within DLG, but we have to make sure we communicate that out to our institutions as well, so that they understand what's happening with their materials at any given point in time. Uh, we try to do this as efficiently as possible, but we are aware that it is a place where we can be better. <laughs> So this is one of the, the ways to get better at doing this. Um, so what did we actually need? 
Well, we needed a number of things. Um, we knew that the whole non-system that we were using was just kind of broken. Um, like a lot of USG institutions, especially during um, the work from home period of the pandemic, uh, USG started pushing everybody into um, at least shared storage. So OneDrive for groups uh, on campus, I think to lessen the VPN load, which is fine. Um, but it was really the only Microsoft product that we had adopted. Um, and I started looking for solutions that would satisfy these requirements. Um, I found a number of things, uh, but ultimately we just couldn't afford to get one or it just wasn't feasible for the team that we were working with. Um, and I came across a presentation that Rachel did it at a conference. And I was like, oh wait, there are people out there who are actually using these types of Microsoft products. Let me start talking to them. Uh, and I did, I talked to Rachel, I talked to like places like the University of Southern Mississippi who does something very similar for digital collections. Um, I talked a lot to the Galileo development team. They do a lot of our like actual technical infrastructure, but they don't manage our workflows and, and uh, actual uh, imaging and metadata work. Uh, so while they don't actually use this system, uh, I was like, hey, you know what I deal with every day. What do you think of these products? And actually they were like, wow, Microsoft has come a long way. And it has. All that said, it's still Microsoft. But I feel like we say that about any product that we use. So um, it, we settled on it because it didn't cost us any money. Um, one really big advantage is that it connects to our UGA emails, which makes communication much simpler. Um, and then it's really low barrier. Microsoft has gone the way of Google and tried to make everything like much easier and more intuitive. And it's actually working rather well. So. Okay, great. So I decided on Microsoft. What happened next? So much discussion. Um, I uh, talked to each of our um, functional units, so the leads on all of them, including like uh, our director, um, our imaging librarian, our newspaper librarians. Um, I asked really open-ended questions. You can see the, the ones I asked up here. I really wanted to get a sense of the big picture of what people needed. Um, I learned a whole lot about needs. I also learned that particularly when you're working with people who are technology inclined and get excited about new technology products, it's really hard for them to answer questions about needs because all they wanna focus on is the wants and the cool things the products can do, um, which is great, right? It's part of the reason I love my team, uh, but it meant that there was a lot of overhead on my part to make sure that I steered conversations to keep them productive and so that I can make sure that I was actually capturing their needs in my conversations. Um, all that said, I really don't think that I would change any of the questions that I asked or how I did this investigation within the, de the department, um, but it is something to be aware of. Like it's, it's a bit of mental overhead to go, yep, I hear you, that's a great one, but I need to go back to this part of the conversation because this sounds like a piece that we really need to focus on. Um, I also had them send me uh, a link for uh, the actual document that we're, they were using to do this work. And interestingly, they all came with, so this is what I use, but I only need about half of it. Uh, so there was a lot of like design in their own systems that they weren't even using. So we were kind of able to cut out a lot of the extra. Uh, yeah, this is what happened. I really wish that I had a picture of my office when I was going through this. She used to look through my door. I had legal paper pads like with lists of words and phrases all over my desk area. I had multiple whiteboards trying to connect things with so many moving parts. I got really paralyzed. I couldn't figure out what, I thought there's no way I can make all of these pieces fit together. There's just too many of them and I can't see the way through. And I got some really sage advice from one of our developers. So shout out to Seamus for that, even though he's not here. He was like, Nicole, just start. Like start with the piece you're most familiar with. Start playing with the tool that you've already selected. You will be able to modify it as you go. This doesn't have to be a one and done thing. Like do a piece and see if it's working then add in the next piece. He's like, you can theorize about this all day long. Uh, and he was absolutely right, and I did, and it was the best advice I could have gotten. 
So I set three big goals to kind of make sure that I got some pro made some progress. One was set up a tracking list for each unit, uh, get my project documents to a central storage location, and then get the lists talking to each other. So there was like as, uh, as little duplication of effort as possible. Um, I wound up with a SharePoint site, uh, some lists, and then a handful of automations. So I don't, I don't actually use Teams. Uh, I, what I did was set up a SharePoint site. And so my lists are at the top of the SharePoint site. Um, and then the shared storage, so our DLG OneDrive is at the bottom. It's one link that all of my team has to worry about instead of like multiple places or uh, which is what Teams tries to do. But we found that this was um, preferable for my folks. Um, and then I, I uh, set up a number of lists and I lever leveraged list views. So um, list views are this really interesting thing. It's like a permanent filter for a spreadsheet, but you can get really complicated with what it shows. Uh, and you can filter out not just rows, but columns. So you can really slice down like a really massive uh, informational list into uh, chunks for the audience it's intended for. So we have like this main institution list, which has a list of all of the partners and potential partners that we could work with in the state. Uh, and then we cut it down into multiple little ones so that uh, there's a contact list that only shows you like contact information for billing and uh, primary projects or PR. Um, but then there's also a storage limit uh, view that we've tailored down for uh, keeping track of how much space people are using on their servers. Um, and it's been really useful uh, because it's much harder to get lost in the system because even though the people are navigating to that slice that they need to see and it's like visually whittled down to a handful of columns, when they go to edit that record, they edit it in the main list uh, and it, it, is, it changes all over the system. The beautiful thing. Everybody gets the updated contact person. Um, I did quickly realize that we needed to leverage uh, two types of lists. It's what I call informational lists and tracking lists. So like our contact list or institution list, for example, is what I call an informational list. It's pretty static. Lots of our other tracking lists use it. Uh, so um, it's where all of that main information that gets related to other lists, much like a relational database lists, like a relational table, if you're familiar with database structure. Um, the other handy thing about list view, ah, we'll skip. The other handy thing about list views is that you can visually completely change them. So like, even though it filters it down like a spreadsheet does, uh, and we do this for a DLG work overview. So it's clumped and categorized by the projects that we have in progress or that are funded or confirmed. You can, in theory, turn it into an ant chart. And that's what people see when they go to the link if you have the right fields in there. Um, Microsoft actually maintains a GitHub where they have templates for this stuff. So you don't actually have to know anything except how to copy the code and paste it in and make sure you have the right columns in place. Uh, so. We haven't actually gotten very fancy with the views, but you can completely customize the view for a, a list. Um, and so you can have your main database spreadsheet looking list and then the, the visual customization for one of those slices. Okay, what the heck is the advantage of using lists this way for us? One of the main advantages is that communication on projects has become uh, way easier and, and transparent. Um, for everybody in the department. So like uh, all products at this point in time, Microsoft has implemented the like at notification system. Um, so you can add comments to a list item, right? So our director can say, hey, I talked to this partner at Imaging Librarian, we're adding four more images to this particular project. Um, if my Imaging Librarian doesn't have up the list application, it sends her an email that says, Hey, somebody mentioned you, you might want to go check this out. So it kind of ties into that notification system of email that we're just kind of beholden to at DLG. Um, 
So my imaging librarian can go and respond to my director. And then when my metadata person gets the project and sees that there's additional uh, images, she can look at the conversation that's happening in the list record and have a full record of everything that's been discussed every point of the way. Uh, the other thing that we did is that we added um, a central location for files related to each project. So if you drop an attachment onto a list item, um, then it will go to a specific folder in the DLG shared storage. Um, I also want to make the distinction here. When I say file or talk about attachments, I'm not talking about like digital assets or things to do with the collection. What I am talking about is things like MOUs or pertinent email chains or um, application packets or all of this thing, all of those documents that come through various things like DocuSign or people's emails or Word documents from somewhere. So we drop those onto the list, they go to the shared storage, and when somebody needs to know if there's been an update to something, if there's been like an official communication, they just go to that one folder and it lives there. It's been really amazing. I think this round of subgrants has been so much easier because we have all of that communication in one spot. There has been way less back and forth. Hey, did you talk to somebody? Hey, who has this document? Hey, who? There's no more guessing where that communication is. Um, we did do a handful of automations. One is to move files to uh, the shared storage. Um, the other is on a couple of our lists. Like if uh, somebody adds something to the newspapers list, it copies it to a general work overview to kind of cut down on the redundancy of us having to copy and paste in multiple locations. We will talk about this in our stumbling blocks. I don't think I'm gonna get more complicated than these automations. Um, they can be finicky at the, that's the best. <laughs> so what do I wanna do with it? Uh, one of the major um, things that I wanna do it is automate emails. So without having any sort of automation, just in list itself, you can set rules. So if uh, a value in this column changes, send, a templated email from this email address to say, hey, Rachel, we started on your, your uh, harvests for this quarter. We'll let you know when they're done. And then hopefully one of my metadata staff can go in and change the complete date and it'll fire off another email. So the attempt here is to make it just more uh, transparent where your projects are uh, in the DLG pipeline. Um, the other thing I really want to do is since most of those attachments come from uh, outside of the system and we have to like manually go in and plop them on the list, I'd love to figure out how to email to a list. I know it's possible. I don't know if I'm up for the challenge, but that's what I'm going to try. Um, and then I'd also like to integrate it with Microsoft Planner. Um, I didn't talk about it because that was set up in DLG before we attempted this, uh, but I think it would make, we use it to update partners on newspapers. Um, and I think it would be nice to be able to go into one sort of spreadsheet-like application and make edits versus, versus having to go into multiple Trello boards, Trello-like boards and do updates. So that's where we're, we're going. All right. So in many ways, she's far more sophisticated than I am. <laughs> that's okay. So for the GSU environment, our functional units are really digital projects, which does all the digitization. Um, we manage our digital project students, and we also have graduate research students who oversee all of our oral history processing. As you know, we are not talking about oral history processing. That's a whole separate um, workflow that I have that does incorporate Office 365, but we're gonna be plugging that into a bigger workflow. So I didn't wanna include it here. Um, then we also have the special collections the department head, and then all the archivists and the staff. And then we also have our scholar work. So our associate dean is the head of scholar works, but we do a lot of digitization of theses to be included in the scholar works. Um, scholar works is not really added in the first iteration until um, it kind of became apparent that we needed to add that as a focus in our second iteration. We also have some um, technical services staff who ask us for projects, but not many. And so the project types that were really initially focused on was digitization request, page and request, and then oral history processing. And again, I'm not talking about oral history processing. Um, but our communication needs that we really wanted to focus on was between um, the functions and also between our partners. 
So when I was evaluating everything, like what I needed was transparency. Wanted to get rid of that black hole um, syndrome and actually give transparency and not only to the archivist, but also to our special collections, excuse me, special collections department head. She noted that um, she would talk to staff about the projects, but she never actually knew what they submitted. So she wanted to see it before I approved it so she can actually approve it. Um, it had me web based because if you attended my session yesterday, you would have noted that um, I don't trust my server. <laughs> so nothing of permanent value really goes on the server when it comes to project management. Um, it had to be automated. I had to get really granular for these projects because we're dealing with the folder and sometimes the item level. And a lot of the software that I was seeing didn't really allow that very well. Um, 10 plus user capacity. Just in my unit, we have about 11 people, and that's not including special collections. Um, interoperability, like it needed to like work with us. And then operating system agnostic, and again, web-based. We have a lot of people who work on Macs. And so we couldn't have a software that did not work on Macs. So that was something that needed to be taken into consideration. So one of the things that the things that I kind of thought about was. What are we currently using? What additional capabilities do I want? Are there issue permit or permission issues that we have with what we but issue permissions with what we were currently using that we wanted to get away from with what we wanted? Um, I did not go through the extensive interview process that Nicole did. <laughs> Kudos to her. Um, I started this process when I started during the pandemic. So I started in May 2020. So this is one of the first things I kind of looked at. And so I had interviews with all the archivists be like, hey, what do you want from me? A lot of them were like, transparency, 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 transparency. I'm like, okay, that's all you want? I can do that. Um, what was my budget? Um, something else that I didn't consider until some conversations with our web services crew was, who's gonna support it if something goes wrong? So if I did get Tro, if I did get a song, if I did get something else, the university is not going to support it. With Officer 65, the university supports it and they will elevate it to Microsoft if things go really wrong, which there have been issues with things going really wrong. And so it's been very helpful to be able to elevate it to our central IT. Um, and then I also tried to doubt what I used at a previous institution. So I used Access and it did not go well. Um, theoretically, Access could be an online version. No, it's not an online version. So I had to kind of adapt what I have. So my system is kind of very linear. So we have project submission, project approval, project ingest, and project tracking. Um, so we used forms, power automated, power automated lists, and then the Microsoft list for all of the tracking. And all of this is through Microsoft Teams. So that's where we access it. That's where the special collection staff will access it. That's where everybody accesses it. Um, they were already using it during the pandemic, so they were familiar with it and it helped. And this is my first go around of it. I just kind of threw something out there just to see what would work. So um, I had the form, it was a very simple form. There were three types of projects. Digitization, a patron request, and the third one was added later for preservation and reformatting. Um, and then on the far right, you can see kind of what the approval looked like in Teams. It would send a message, um, email and message in Teams that says, you have an approval. And it really only had the project title on there, nothing else. Um, and once that was approved, it went to our master tracking list. So we had two types of lists. Master tracking list, which has all of the submissions that are added there. Then we have a secondary list that is actually granular um, tracking for that project. So, some of the observations I had from the first round was the form is not one size fits all. We ended up having six different types of scenarios, and the one flow did not work for all six scenarios. We tried, and it we knew we had to fix it. Um, and the flow that we had created was over was overkill for some of the projects. So the theses, there really was no approval needed for theses. It did not have to go to Christina. It, it needed to come to me, but it was more like, 
it's happening. There's no like, it's not happening, it's happening. So we really didn't need that. Um, our master projects list started to get messy. We also had some um, messy data that was submitted. So we needed to clarify what was supposed to go where. Don't just put your title as digitized book. <laughs> Great, what's that book? Um, and the information in the approval queue was also insufficient for the department head to be able to say, yes, we can do this. Um, and the archivists could not see their submissions, and they were very salty about that. <laughs> so I had to fix that. This is the first. <laughs> it was all Lisa. Um, but as a first iteration, I think it went relatively well. Definitely as you're doing this and you get feedback, keep a post-it or a document or something that you can just jot it down. Don't rely on your memory and you're not going to remember. So always keep a running list when you go for version two and have that feedback. So as I said, we expanded the project submission to six different sections. We have normal digitization requests. We have ILL and patron requests. We have thesis requests. We have exhibit digitization requests. We have born digital um, uploads and then preservation reporting. And so all of those sections needed different information. There was some repeat questions. Um, we're like, great, it'll be the same question. But when it comes to actually doing the automate and the flow, your questions are also different. Because if you have the same question, you're not going to know which section you're pulling it from. So we made sure that all of our forms um, and all of the questions were specific to that section. What is the title of the project for digitization? What is the title of the thesis for digitization? What is the title of the object for preservation and formatting? So that way we can actually differentiate on the back end. And Lisa has not seen this yet. <laughs> um, and then the approval, project approval. So we actually changed this top one so it actually was closer to what the project type was. We also had the project title, project description, and if the copyright had already been transferred to GSU, because that was a big one that our, the department had wanted to see. Um, you can see that's what it looks like. And then project ingest. Let's see if this will work. There's something else. Come on. It's okay, this does not lie. No, oh well. So the project ingest um, really was the flow. And so we ended up having six streams within this power automate, one for each section of um, the form. So we had one specific for collection uh, digitization, one specific for thesis, because we had to bypass certain steps for each one of them. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to build. And again, make sure your questions are different for everything. Um, in there, we have um, imported our master tracking list. In the case of theses, we just imported the theses list and have it directly go there and just have like a little notification in the master that says, there's a new project under this one. Um, I'm almost kind of glad it's not true because it looks intimidating, but it's really not. It really isn't. So Power Automate calls, calls its like sort of programming flows and they literally find out chart so start here arrow mm -hmm. to the next bit like so here's a, a set of decisions so you can watch your, your and they have templates yeah. so you're not building this from scratch so i used the approval queue template and then i added the um list i literally just looked at another template and kind of and used it. so you're not building this from scratch hence why you don't need a programmer to do this mm -hmm. So for project tracking, um, this is our master project list. So we have all of the form, all of the sections from the form in there. We have the copyright, when there's a due date, and so this is kind of what it looks like. And this is one of our um, project lists. So we have this for every single type of project. Um, it's been very, very helpful because I don't have to bug my staff to be like, hey, what's going on? It's done. I can actually just go in, look at it. All of our uh, archivists have access to this. They have read-only access to this, so they can go in and check to see what the status 
of their project that is they have not. They have not. They have asked for it and asked for it and they have not. And you probably did it to test it. And I was very overwhelmed by sheer amount of information. And so we also do this with our grant projects too. So we'll have track and roll over grant projects as well. This is that way we also separate out the metadata from the project tracking. Because there's no option to put it in there. So looking towards our future, we're definitely going to be integrating SharePoint more. Um, we also want to do some of those, those views that you have. But um, everything is attached to our personal emails, and we're hoping to attach it to our departmental email. Um, our departmental email is just kind of like a shell email, so there's going to take some investigating on that one. Um, we're going to be fine tuning the current power on me and the workflows just because I found like, hey, I'm missing space. And if there is more information that you need to add, we can add it to the specific um, flows. And then also um, communication through the list and sending notifications. They have built-in notifications that sometimes work. And so we're definitely looking at getting a bit more of those notifications. So we actually have a, um, a stable notification system that's reliable. So review and reflection. Okay, yeah, so where was it painful, right? Because that's what everybody wants to know. Um, I'll start uh, with Power Automate. Seems like a super cool feature that makes all kinds of things fantastic and it's gonna make your life wonderful. It writes so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure if I were a SharePoint administrator and I had time to learn the system, it would not be as problematic as this. I don't actually have anybody in my organization that I can rely on to kind of walk me through this stuff. So what I'm doing is very simple. Um, and I have found that if you try to modify your list in any way other than just adding or deleting or modifying an item, like if you try to rearrange columns, you're going to break your automations, right? Anything that you do, renaming it, it like it's even if it doesn't have anything to do with the automation, <laughs> it's just really particular. Um, I also figured out, and this is not a Microsoft thing, this is a UGA thing. Um, it UGA requires me to log into Power Automate every so often to re-authenticate. Uh, if I don't, my things just stop running, but they don't tell me that. <laughs> so uh, it's a reminder on my calendar that I have to set to log in every few months to make sure that my, my automations are still running, um, even though there's nothing wrong with the automation itself. Um, uh, another um, weird, yeah, it, it's, it's finicky. But what the, when it does work, it has made the process so much easier. And just be patient as you're doing this because you are going to feel like you're going over everything over and over and over and over and over and you're going to get sick and you're going to want to throw your finger out. <laughs> just be patient. Take some time away from it and we'll walk back to it and look at it with fresh eyes. Um, and also your intention versus what actually happens. It's not always clear. And what you think you're doing is not what somebody else sees. And so again, be patient as you're doing it. Now, one of the things for DLG in particular that we came across after we had launched into this is that everything that we do, we try to make publicly accessible because we do this for you, for y'all. Um, and the way that UGA sets up Microsoft groups, which is they, they like uh, a group is synonymous with a department essentially. Um, we can't use the function accessible to or view from anyone with the link, like that Google terminology or what we can't turn it on for anything that's associated with the DLG group, uh, which is weird to me. I don't understand why they do it. Uh, we can share it um, with a particular email. So if you have, uh, if we need to communicate a particular bit of our tracking to you, we can add you and give you permission to view the thing. Uh, since it's supposed to be an internal workflow, um, we decided that that was okay. Um, we weren't going to fight that, and we'll share as we need to, but it's it's unfortunate. Um, and I'll also say that it looks like you can do a lot. It can. Um, in the case of DLG, because we're passing information back and forth, there's only like three types of data that these products want to pass back and forth. Free text, yes or no, and like dates. So if you want to use any of the other 45 customizable fields, 
outside of the list that it's in, it's not possible. Uh, it's still better. Than what we're I should also say, how should I transfer? When you're transferring in like your projects, um, it can be very difficult. You can theoretically create a list from Excel spreadsheet. Oh, um, it don't do it. Um, you can actually copy and paste into a list from Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. 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 Um, it took a long time to figure that out and to get it working properly, but you can. And in the interest of time, we're gonna skip forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So up. I will say on the reflection of this, one of the big things that I took away was really assess your needs. What do you actually need versus what do you want? What can you realistically do with this and the time that you have to work on it? Um, and when you're implementing, how much time can you afford to work on this yourself? Whoever's working on it for you, how much time can they devote to it? How much time can you spend fixing it? Um, be very honest with the answers to those questions. This can be really powerful, even if, it, if it's most like simplistic implementation. Uh, it's gotten a lot better. I don't complain about it any more than I complain about other tech products that we use. <laughs> so, and again, remember, keep a running list as you're building this and as you're using it on what you want to fix. And also reach out to your network because more than likely something's already done it. Um, I reached out to a couple of listservs and I found that Penn State was using Office 365 um, and the morning museum of last lives and they were doing different things on I was like that's really cool tell me how you did it and, like we shared like screenshots of our automations and how we did things and we adapted um one of the things that as I was preparing for this presentation I was reflecting on was a lot of this is digital projects and a lot of stuff that you guys use also very digital but this could easily be adapted for processing queues. So as you have collections that are coming in and you need like a stable place to sort through all those projects that you need to process and all the collections that you need to process, this could easily be adapted to that. And so don't just think of this as something for digital. It could really help you also with managing your physical collections as well. So any questions? Y'all all stayed awake and we appreciate you. Yes. <laughs> and then we're also kind of hungry. Oh my gosh. You blow your mind and you're just like absorbing it all. Again, we're absolutely happy. If you want to see how any of this works, we'll, we're happy to show you. I mean, I don't think either one of us regrets doing it. Um, no. Microsoft implementation is kind of better. It's worth looking at if you're kind of in one of these ruts where you just got to move to something else. Okay. And just try it. Just throw something on the wall and see if it sticks. <laughs> That's what I did. And I'm like, all right, this will work. Thanks. <laughs>